Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for the QVCC's plasterboard presentation. The Queensland Building and Construction Commission acknowledges the traditional custodians of this land and pays respect to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Perry Ewan and I am the Education and Engagement Officer from QVCC's Brisbane office and I will be your MC today. Tonight's technical presentation will identify some of the most common areas of failure submitted as defect complaints to the QVCC and as identified by our building inspectors when undertaking assessment of defective building work out in the field. The QVCC has engaged the peak plasterboard body in Queensland, the Association of Walls and Ceilings Industry, or AWCI, to pass on their expertise and address some of the more common issues that continually arise in the plasterboard and broader building industry. Please note there may be written or visual references to branded products during tonight's presentation that are used for illustrative purposes only. The QBCC does not endorse one brand of product over another and acknowledges their inclusion in the presentation as typical examples of products available on the market today. Today's presentation will be delivered in two parts. Firstly, a technical presentation on plasterboard installation, best practice, common defects and finishing. The second part of today's presentation will be about firewalls and separation in Class 1 and 1A residential buildings and then Class 2 to 9 structures. Our guest speakers representing AWCI today are Wayne Kennedy and Peter Blaine, and we also have Aidan Brisbane, who is the State Technical Manager for CSR, working away in the background, ready to take all your questions with the QVCC team. Now, on to our first speaker, Wayne Kennedy. Wayne is the Technical and Training Manager for USG Borrell, covering from Coffs Harbour to Darwin. He is a member of the HIA Technical Committee, AWCI Queensland Committee, and is currently the QVCC Liaison for Industry Matters throughout Queensland, and also performs a similar role in the Northern Territory. So, without any further ado, I would like to welcome Wayne to commence tonight's presentation. Thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the QBCC for the invite for the AWCI to represent the passport industry. It's been a while since we've had the opportunity. And of course, we were approached uh, some time ago to look at the defects that are commonly seen throughout the industry by the building inspectors. And we're going to look at the level four finish, installation, screw popping and so forth throughout the area. We'll also do a second part of the presentation where we'll cover off fire penetrations and firewalls from class 1A to class 2 and class 9. So. Today we'll reference standard installation manuals from all the manufacturers and also the AWCI trade guidelines and information booklet, the standards and tolerances guide from the QBCC and the Australian standards to AS2589. Materials being delivered to the site, this is where your level four starts once we've got the product delivered to site. So up on the top uh, right hand of the screen we've got some photos here that show access to the actual buildings and sites. You can see we've got rubble and bricks, concrete and sand in the way. On the bottom left hand side through the middle and down the right hand side we've got clear access. So once again if your passport can't be delivered safe and clear and damage free to site you won't get, be able to acquire a level 4 finish. Stacking and storing material on site it's essential that you actually clear the area for the plaster would be stacked nice and straight and out of harm's way or water or moisture if it can be prevented. So ensure the sheet sheets are stacked vertically in bundles of no more than 20 sheets and they're adequately restrained. A pack of plasterboard can weigh up to 1,200 kilos. So if you are propping, you need to make sure that your floors are propped adequately and in a suitable position. It's essential, again, considering the weight that's moved up and down off the floors. Once again, if the floor starts to bow, you're going to get the plasterboard follow the same contour and the same line. So if you're going to stack against the walls, make sure the walls are secured, nailed and battens and braces are firmly placed. Exiting the site, on the left hand side we've got a simple picture again of a truck being cleaned adequately and rubble to get in and out of the driveway. Um, down the bottom right hand side we've got a photo there showing obviously a truck leaving site and taking debris and mud out up the road, which would incur a fine. That fine could be up to around six, seven thousand dollars. Again, for a simple load of plasterboard to be delivered properly, we don't want to be leaving those messes out on the site. Plastering for a good finish, it starts with planning. So, the first thing you want to do is to check straightness of the frame. 
So the QBCC, the AWCI and Australian Centres all reference level four finishes throughout the residential and commercial aspect in construction. A level four finish is then deemed the finish that your client will require when handing over the home or the commercial unit or the industrial building. So level four simply is a three coat system with back blocking and all joints are covered and prepared with pre-paint for paint. A level five finish is another step up where the frames actually have to have a certain tolerance in straightness and plumbness and a passport will actually be laid slightly different to achieve a level five. Once again, the level four finish is deemed the required finish at the start of the job. Deviation, framing, whether it be metal, steel or timber, you have to have over four mil, 1.8 metres straight edge and you cannot have any more than four mil deviation over 90% of the area. Simply looking at the drawing on the screen, we can see the straight edge starting from the left hand side and the bottom corner of the truss slightly deviated, the third and the fourth back in line again. The bottom drawing shows us another deviation along that 1.8 metres, which is four mil, and then the left hand side there's a drawing that shows a straight edge up against plumb against the wall. All again referring back to AS2589. So on the screen now, the typical left, the plaster is checking for frame straightness. And um, on the right hand side, where we've got some trusses and battens and a steel joist going through. Once again, he's marked that up, so he's obviously got an issue there with some sort of deviation. Need to remember again, the plasterboard can only follow the contour of the actual substrate. If your substrate is not straight, the plasterboard is going to follow that. You aren't going to get some deviations. The bottom drawing shows where the trimmers have had to change direction and have had to noggin that out. Uh, again, typically the QVC bring that to our attention where the trimmers haven't been installed, uh, particularly around the edges of the garages and our frescoes and so forth. So the next uh, photo shows typically braces sticking out of noggins, studs, um, top plates and so forth. You can see the brace on the left hand drawing at the top. Once again, the plaster is painting that just to note that that's going to cause some sort of deviation either on the wall sheet or the corners. Twisting or protruding frame members. Um, this is a typical wall where you can see the noggins are not straight. They're going to cause twists in the strut. There's also another issue there with that's a mould, and that's typical of what we've seen when the frame's been out of the weather for time. Once again, you want to have dry timber, dry frame, no water pooling around, otherwise your plasterboard, the Gibson line is going to soak that up and cause your mould issue down the track. Steel frames. So currently in southeast Queensland, we do a lot of steel frame houses now far more than we have done in the past. We still get deviation in those frames because of braces, um, all the steel frames, noggins and so forth. Some of them do incur twists, some have uh, noggins sticking out proud, so it's the same factor as we have in timber. Again, it's four mil over 1.8 metres. So the installation of the wall and ceiling lining, it is critical that your plasterer uses a 30 mil W screw into the ceiling, timber. The QPCC bring this to our attention many times a year and it's surprising how many times we see 25 mil screws installed in the ceiling. So the defects that the QPCC have discussed with the AWCI haven't really changed over the last 10 years. It's the same items coming up on the defect list all the time. This is such a common issue and it's such a simple issue to be fixed. The correct screw must be used. Adhesion and screw layout for the ceiling. So there's two methods. We prefer to use a one-third fixing method now. Going back some years ago, we used a centre fixing where we used to put a screw in the centre of the sheet each side of the centre line and then towards the end. And that allowed for the setting to be a lot quicker and it was probably a quicker installation as well. The third fixing method now, the one-third fixing method now we use, allows us to get a better layout and a flatter surface along the plasterboard and we don't seem to get as many humps or rises in the actual sheet itself. So again, there's two drawings there, and the preferred method is the bottom right-hand corner. Adhesive screw and layout. So the adhesive screw is about 200 mil nominally off the screw centre itself. You'll see on the top left-hand photo that there's an adhesive daub sitting there, and then the screw obviously down on the right-hand side. On the right-hand bottom photo on the screen is a tick with the screw, and it's just below the paper surface. The one on the right with the cross 
is too far below the surface. It's actually broken the paper. So no matter what plasterboard system you're using, you don't want to break the core into the core and expose it. You want to actually just sit it nice mm -hmm. and flush. Insulation as far as the layout goes on your walls and linings too. Once again, minimise bud joins. We like to use long, full sheets where we can, where possible and practical. And obviously the less plasterboard joints that we have, the less issues we're going to have with glancing light and so forth. So it always is a good idea to get that layout first before you order your sheets and make sure that those walls, again, are straight to minimise any layout with glancing light. Butt joints, they must be back blocked. Um, here's a typical drawing here where they've used a temporary stitching batten and also down the bottom drawing where they've used the back blocking and adhesive and so forth there. You can see there's a few details on those drawings. Again, you should refer back to the manufacturer's specification of the plasterboard lining. It's their installation detail that you should stick to. Most of the common installation methods are also in the Australian standards. Once again, QBCC refers back to them and so does the AWCI. And the installation of uh, walls and ceilings back lock blocking is required. There's a typical drawing again showing a layout, some nominal widths and so forth. You notice that the plasterboard system installation on a ceiling is studded easy screws and back blocking. You can also do a screw and fix method with studded easy, but your centers have to be brought in for your screw fixings. Once again, refer back to the manufacturer of the product that you're using and they'll have that in their installation manual. Installation of ceiling lines in our frescoes, garage and external areas. This is a hot topic for the QBCC as we speak. I know they are doing audits out on site. It's come up year in, year out, where they continually see ceilings collapse, uh, particularly outside. Once again, we don't use studded easy outside. Look at your screw fixings. Preference to use ceiling battens where practical and make sure that you've got members so you can stick the corners line up and the corners uh, as a decorative lining as well. So good ventilation, sarking, trimmers, everything like that, it all makes the perfect job. If you don't do either of those, sometimes you're going to come unstuck. You can see the drawing on the right hand side is where a ceiling has collapsed. We can look at certain issues there. They've used stud adhesive. Perhaps the screw centers weren't correct. But also we can see in the top right hand corner, there's no trimmers installed. So again, we are talking about an outside area where it receives wind vibration and so forth. We receive more weather and moisture outside as well. So it's critical that we get that right in external ceilings. Wet area installations, best to refer back to the manufacturer of the product that you're using. All their screw centers and fixing methods will vary. Typically, plasterboard gypsum linings will vary to fiber cement linings. Some of the manufacturers use a tile weight rather than a tile size. Uh, again, it's important to refer back to the fibre cement manufacturer or the pasteboard gypsum lining manufacturer to nominate what screw fixings, type of screw you need to do and what size studs you are. So compliance of cavity sliding door systems in wet areas. This has been ordered by the QBCC now for about the last 12 months. The straightforward, simple answer is you should be using a false wall in front of your cavity slider. You should be referring back to your cavity slider manufacturer for their installation details. And it's very common now for that cavity slider to have tiles on it. That's why they're seeing failing and separation of the tiles off the walls. Hence why they've said a false wall is critical to get that wet area substrate perfect. Expansion joints. Expansion joints should minimise a lot of these defects where we see cracking in a corner line. We see some of the plasterboard having pressure on it from different bottom cords of the trusses and so forth. Expansion joints, again, you should refer back to the manufacturer of the product and they'll tell you where those expansion joints should be and at what junction they should be put on. Typically on the screen now we can see the control joint in pair figure 35 just into timber. If you note, the timber frame has been installed so it can allow for the expansion joint. If you are the builder, it's your responsibility to put that substrate in to allow the plaster to finish the expansion joint in the correct place. You see in the bottom left drawing on the screen now, there's some cracking in the plasterboard. That's obviously typically done because the expansion joint wasn't put in the correct area. Expansion joints between the mid floors. Again, it's typically up to the builder to install that as far as the fixing method goes for battens or um, joists, timber joists, steel joists, whatever they're going to use. Again, they should have a 10mm gap there and allow for that movement up and down. 
Uh, the joint doesn't have to be set. You can use timber there as well. Obviously, like the drawing there on the right-hand side, that's nice, quick and easy for everybody. Finishing. So finishing is critical. It's what every homeowner sees or unit dwelling owner or commercial owner sees. They just want to see what's on the outside, the paint and so forth. They don't see a lot of the work that goes on behind it. Again, level four is deemed to finish under non-critical light in Queensland, in the Australian standards. It's what the AWCI, it's what the QBCC, and it's what all manufacturers stick to as level four finish. So here's a typical um, stopping or setting as we call it now, with the first coat, second coat, third coat, fourth coat, and the finishing coat and the sanding. So in this drawing here, we've got someone doing it the old way, where we just do a little trailing by hand. You can see they've got some nominal widths there of 200 mil in your second coat, and then a finishing coat of 250, and then obviously send it out wider. This photo on the screen now shows the new way that we do it, mechanical boxes and that. Once again, it's up to the tradesman. The standard itself, to get a level four, doesn't vary between mechanical or manual tools. It still gives us a level four finish at 250 wide. External corners. Joining must not be less than 250 mil either side of the external corner. Joining build up at the external angle should not exceed three mil and be feathered away from the corner. Again, if the frame is not plumb or straight, the plaster following that substrate, the plaster following that substrate, he's got no chance of achieving that level four and be with inside the tolerances. Internal corners is the same. Again, got to treat them with taping compound. Uh, shouldn't be less than 100 mil either side of the corner. And level four or five must have a third coat of application. Again, referring back to AS2589-2017. Sanding. You see on the photo on the top left, they've used a mechanical sander. It's pretty common these days. Again, this is where a job can go wrong. It's again when the QVC call us to look at the defect or the issue. The plastering and the installation, the fixing, everything could be great up to that time. And then the sanders come along or there's been an error with the sanding and they furred up the edges and just get that little paint um, defect and it comes all back to the paint up. He says back to the plaster, the plaster then refers back to the first person. But... If you control the job at the start, sanding is actually critical to give us a level four finish. Pre-painting, let's rest assured, all the manufacturers don't send their board out with holes in it like that. That's typical of a job that we'd look at on a daily basis. Pre-paint, depth damage has been done by other tradesmen, by the plasterer, by deliveries, whatever it be, but that is so typical of what we would see in, in any wall, particularly on the corridor walls, and particularly in high-rise units, it seems to be more prone to it. So again, pre-paint is absolutely critical. Painting, so to get a level four finish, we must also consider the paint performance. So the performance of the finished paint system and the appearance of the walls and ceilings are wholly dependent on the quality of the paint used, the application method, and the color and sheen level. If you are going to use dark colors, you may not get that perfect level four finish that require. If you're using high gloss, you may also get defects that you wouldn't have seen under a low sheen. So inspecting those surfaces in a glancing light, again, when we're on site, we see a lot of people use torches and lights and so forth to highlight the defects in the plasterboard insulation or the setting and the joints. The diagram clearly shows out of ASNZS2589 that you would be at 1.5 metres under natural light. That's typically of how the AWCI, QBCC would rule as far as a glancing light issue goes, it's at 1.5 metres away. So internal lighting. The photo on the left on the screen now shows a typical building finished. And then we're taking a photo 20 minutes later on the right hand side of what those joints look like. This is definitely a critical light issue. Those joints on the left are perfectly flat, but it just goes to show what the different time of day can do. The sunlight, the windows up the top there, probably not helping. Once again, this could come back to your design and have solved some of this problem before we actually started the install. That concludes my presentation on Level 4 Finish. Thank you very much. We'll now hand to Peter Blaine to go through Class 1A, Class 2 and Class 9 with fire and penetrations. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne, for a really informative presentation, which I'm sure our audience is sure to take away some very useful information. Now on to the second part of our technical presentation, and I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Blaine. Peter is the technical director at Plus Passive Fire and has been in the construction in industry for over 40 years. 
His know-how comes from many aspects of the industry, working hands-on as a carpenter, plasterer, domestic and commercial builder, fire and acoustic technical rep, and he provides project management services for major builders and interior companies. I will now hand over to Peter for the second part of tonight's presentation. Thanks, Perry. And Wayne, I've been around the AWCI for a long time, and those defects are the same defects we've been talking about for, if not 20 years, 30 years. So a collaboration approach to try and deal with those is a great thing. So my mission today is around uh, pacifier and separation. When QBCC asked AWCI, could we talk about this? I actually grabbed it with both hands and said, absolutely. As a company, we have seven certifiers in the field. I just want to share with you some of the findings we have. We keep stats on everything. Uh, we love knowing what, what happened, how things failed, why things failed. These should scare us as an industry. And this was probably a couple of months worth of stats, maybe 200 inspections. 79% of those failed the initial inspection. At some level, it could be a screw missing, a bit of cork, but some of those were also interventions that pull down and start again. I'm talking about boundary walls, party walls, class two to nine. The other stat on the side, 38%, almost 40%, cost 2,000 or more to rectify. While we were there, while we said, stop, you've got a problem, this is how you're gonna fix it, that's too green. If you wait, leave it and don't fix it up, when we get to the end of the build, that could be that could be twenty thousand dollars. Quite often, I get calls going, "Oh, can you have a look at one of our walls for us?" So we would send one of our inspectors out, and we had one the other day. He rang up and said, "I've got the building certifier coming in uh, on Monday, and I'm not sure I've done it right." So one of our guys went to site, had a look at it, told him all the things that he had wrong, and it was quite it was quite significant. On Monday, followed that up with a quote, and he goes, "Oh no, we don't need you anymore. He didn't find anything." That should scare me if you're a building certified, it should also scare you. But it, the building certified may not find it then, but at the end of the job, you might have another look. At 12 months time, you might have a body corporate doing inspection. And in two years time, you may have a building in pest that will go, those firewalls don't look right. That, that at some point, if you're doing it wrong, you will be found out. This is a tsunami that's coming at us as an industry. We do a lot of inspections of post building in pest. And so many of those are high defects. Uh, and I'm going to run through some of those details. So I've got 30 odd minutes. I'm not going to make you a pacifier expert. What I would, my mission today is make you sure that you're aware it's a huge issue. If fire is on any of your buildings you're doing, if you're a builder, um, have a whole different process. You need to know what you're doing. And if you're relying on Gaz has always done this and Gaz is always is an expert in this field, I can generally tell you most of the Gaz gets it wrong. I just want to play a video just to give you a bit of a perspective about what we're doing. So this is what they call a classic Christmas tree fire. So it's a, a live tree, sit in the corner. You can tell by the furnishings, it's probably uh, London 1970, I think. But if you watch the fire grow, this is probably a short out of the, of the lighting system. But either way, the, the light has ignited the old tree. And if be aware of the time frame. We're at 30 seconds at the moment. If you look at the couch, the actual fabric on the couch starts exploding. That generally tells me that the temperature is above about 110 C. Uh, this other picture, if you look at the uh, the desk, all the t all the papers, the fire's not quite near, but it's igniting it. Um, if you look down a bit lower the carpet, we're at 44 seconds. If there's a room in the back left-hand corner, which I, I know there's a door there, no one's coming out of that door. 50 seconds, if you're on the floor, you may be able to crawl out. And at 60 seconds, the whole room is engulfed. So, so that is what, everyone talks about a 60 minute fire. That should scare you. And the intensity of that fire is, if that's in one room, one townhouse, for example, if I've got one 10 mil hole, that's 10 millimeters, size of your finger hole, through the wall, the fire pressure in there will force smoke through that hole to the point that within about four and a half minutes, the unit next door has full death choke, as in not surviving. Interestingly, I think 60% of all deaths in fire are in the not in the compartment where it started. And 80% of all deaths in fires are caused by smoke. So smoke's our big issue. I talked about some defects before. Here's a classic one. This is actually a, a QBCC repair. Every time I show that, I think the whole organization has a shutter. What they did, they installed the bath, uh, put the plasterboard around the bath, and that was the firewall. If you have a look at the bigger the photo or the blow up photo on the right, the space under the bath, that's the photo on the right, is just open. There's no separation there at all. 
this was rectified. We because it was eight bathrooms, obviously got tiling and waterproofing. It was about one hundred eighty-four thousand to fix this up. That's a defect you don't want to be dealing with. So the common defects that came to us were these, and this is in class one. You can read through the lift, but you know clips and layer and joints. These are the issues that we find in class one, predominantly plasterboard, predominantly uh, lightweight plasterboard. I'm going to deal with all those there, so we don't need to sort of labor on them at the moment. I just want to talk about FRLs. Everyone talks about 60, 60, 60. Not always everyone understands what we're talking about. The first 60 minute, that's the structural adequacy. That's the, the, the wall stays up in a fire, it's holding upstairs, or the column stays up. The middle one, which is integrity, and that's flames and, and gases don't get through it, so it doesn't spread the fire. And the last one is insulation criteria. That's the temperature on the other side of the wall doesn't get above a certain temperature. These are the 60, 60, 60s, and it's really, you need to understand that, but it's also an indicative from a fire test. It's the 1530 part four test. It's a fairly typical sort of curve. I've been sharing as we've been traveling around the state that I've been inspection recently on the kitchen table was a V8 motor and stacked against the firewalls was petrol, oil and the greaser. And I'm sure if that was a fire, that's going to be way hotter than that. Conversely, I've, I've been in burnouts recently where the whole unit is burnt out and the plasterboard hasn't even been affected. Very black, but it, the fire was out in about 60, in, in about 13 or 14 minutes and it didn't quite have to integrate. But either way, that's what we're trying to achieve and that's the, the, the standard. This is a Class 1A building in Brisbane. You can see that one structure is fully burnt to the ground. This was an incomplete or it wasn't even lined inside, but it gives you an idea of what we're trying to achieve with Class 1, and that is one building can fall to the ground. This is indicative of, of what we're trying to achieve. This is where a flame can be in one unit. It can collapse without pulling the unit down next door to it. That's our fundamentals of trying to do with party walls. In any situation, if you're a builder on site or if you're a building certifier or if you're uh, doing the, the carpentry or plastery, you've got to at least have the systems that we need. So these are typical, uh, the various manufacturers. If you've got someone on your site building a party wall, say, at least ask, do they have the install guide? Because all I hear all the time is, oh, we've always done it this way. We're experts at this. We've done heaps of them. They're part of that 80% defects that we defect all the time. Uh, don't take chances with this. This is serious, serious stuff. For those manufacturers, they all have checklists. Use the checklist. It, it, it talks about the things you need to look at. Uh, I know when QBCC go to site and do inspections, they've got their own checklist, and they're looking at stuff that is the common stuff, which is those lists we have. In a shaft liner system, this is the concept we're talking about. 25 mil shaft line in the middle, plasterboard on either side. The plasterboard on the outside is not fire rated, but it is there for acoustic reasons. The biggest mistake we see quite often is the builder's putting up the wall, he might use borrow in the middle, the contractor's a CSR contractor, he puts CSR on the inside. That's not a tested system. We can't mix manufacturers uh, and you need to make sure that's critical. And also the insulation is very critical from an insulation point of view. So here's some wall clips. These are the, the biggest defect we see is about clips. The clips are an aluminium clip and it's meant to melt in the fire. So on, if it's on one side of the wall, that clip melts, the building falls to the ground. What we can't have is, if you can see at the top right there where I've got the pointer, the clips have got to be on the stud. You can't have them laminated to plasterboard. You can't have them in the nogging because this is a acoustic issue as well and that would be a, uh, we'd lose our discontinuous and we'd lose our fire rating at that point. The other things we can't have, clips over the top. I think the bottom, the, the bottom left there, that's up over the top. If there's a fire this side, that's melting the clip. This has got to be on that side. We can't bend clips. We can't finish them short because all those are uh, issues. I'll also point out this step here. This is generally when we've, a, we've got a garage step down. I can't do that. If I do, I've got a uh, nog top and bottom, clip top and bottom, and in fact, it's not part of the DTS system, so we can't have joins and studs. Other things we can't have, studs have got to be inside the track. Clearly, you can see this is. You can also see the cores damaged. The studs have got to line up. There's a real challenge in the industry where I've got uh, one manufacturer, in, case, in this case, Borel, like the studs lining up, that's how it was tested. I think there's a maximum 15 mil offset, whereas CANAF and CSR um, have no regulations around that. What we do as a, as a company are uh, trying to encourage, and when we do our training, is we train everyone in the most onerous. Um, while Borel won't allow you to offset it, um, CSR has certainly got no problem if you do put it in line. So we try and pick the most onerous, and that's the way we teach everyone. Because the last thing you want to do is that you don't want to have different training based on different um, manufacturers. 
And here's another issue. You can see the 150 extension above. So this is where the extra layer of board. So everywhere there's no linings. So you can see the linings down the bottom. Everywhere there's no linings, I need the extra layer of board. And in this case, this is a canaf. It's got to be 150 up. I think we've got Borel and CSR, once, once 200, once 150. Same argument before. We tell everyone, have 200. In fact, don't have 200, have 250. It's, it's not that hard to get things on. Um, and that, if you have a look at the top right-hand corner, where you've got a step in the floor, it's 150 or 200 in this case, 200 down and 200 up. So we just need to ensure we've got that covered. This is a case where I've got a step bulkhead. This is the new ceiling. The underside of the bulkhead is the new ceiling. I need to be 200 mils down from that. There's a conjecture around that, that um, yeah, the ceiling is up the top, but really this is that's unprotected. The other issue I had, and I had that bath one previously, below the bath, the wall stop, you know, even if the, the plasterboard stops on top of the bath, the bit below is actually an open. It also needs the, the laminate strip like we're showing on the right there, on the left. One of our biggest issues is rock wall at the top. Post completion defects, and uh, I can tell you we get called into a lot of townhouses, um, and nearly the biggest defect we see are uh, rock wall done incorrect. The anti-con, which is the fiberglass above the insulation, uh, above the sarking, can't be in there. The rock wall's got to be in there. It's got to be compressed. Um, you'll see it's 300 mils wide. So many issues are made with that. If you're using block work, same issue. It's just you've got to have that rock wall at the top um, correct. <laughs> Sadly, the photo on the right is what we see everywhere. Uh, batten's through, unprotected. In, in fact, that is, that's not even fireboard, so it's, it's, it's bad at every level. The photo on the left is out of the, the Bradford uh, install guide. That's how we're supposed to see it. 300 mil wide, nice and tight, compressed with the roof goes on top. This is how we, we get um, compliance and compartmentalization. The, the pink insulation on top, that's what we're talking about with the, uh, the, uh, uh, in, the fiberglass on top of the anticon. It's what, one of our next biggest defect is that's left in a lot of cases. Everyone compresses the, the rock wall, but the challenge is that burns about 350, 400 degrees. Um, that has got to be uh, intact for 1120, which is what Rockwell does. You can also note this particular one was a defect because that's where the firewall finished, if you can see down the bottom there, and had this big gap in the middle, um, which had to be rectified. In fact, they had to extend that up. The top left, that is a, um, that's supposed to be a firewall. It's supposed to go to the roof. I don't think it's going to work very well. Um, and the, the one on the right is really indicatively this is what we want to see. Um, this is obviously not a shaft liner. It's a, it's a twin stud system. But they, yeah, they've done a great job of the rock wall, but the battens aren't filled, which is also a defect. The other thing we can't have, we can't have timber through walls. We can't have valley through walls, can't have studs through walls. If you think that concept about um, one unit can fall to the ground, it's a bit hard to fall to the ground if you've got a beam going through or a truss going through. So just be really conscious about uh, timber passing through. There are solutions around that, um, but from a starting point, that's what we want to do. The other huge defect we see is this triangle out on the eaves has not been done. Historically, and by historically, I mean two weeks ago and backwards, um, so many of those triangles were not done. Um, there's a solution down the bottom that's a bat solution. Um, there's also uh, board solutions. So easy to do as you're building, so hard to do retrospectively. Same, same story with the rock wall. If you're doing it retrospectively, um, you're pulling roofs off and you're getting in the roof spaces and it's very difficult. The other compartmentalization is on the, the top right, uh, and that's the cavity barrier at the uh, at where the wall ends finishes, um, that's also got to be uh, smoked rated as well. This is where we got cladding issue. You'll also note that it says a, a joint there. Some manufacturers want a joint, some don't, some are, have an optional. In this case, for CSR, um, but it's got to be tight and it's got to be tight together and fire rated. There's also an insulation requirement. Either side of the wall needs to be insulated from an acoustics point of view. Um, quite often you walk up a stairs, you see a downlight at the top of the stairs, you know it's inside that zone that you've uh, got to look at. Just be real careful about that and make sure that we've got the insulation criteria or the acoustic insulation covered as well as the fire rating. What we're trying to do is DTS. So we're, we're trying to follow a Borel system or a CSR system or a CANAF or a James Hardy or a Pronto or any other systems that we use. Wood solutions have some an alternate answers and generally it's around uh, char value of timber and they are somewhat uh, product agnostic, they don't care whose board it is. Um, so sometimes when we've got uh, incorrect installs, and I will say that a, a lot of our business is, is done uh, going in fixing up after inspections and people are defecting, building certifiers being decided or QBCC has been decided, and all of a sudden we're back trying to fix things up. This gives us some options around the wood solutions. I just put forward as an option. 
The other huge issue we have is cantilevers. And I'm talking about true cantilevers. That's when the uh, downstairs garage sometimes and there's an upstairs bedroom next door. The, the, this area here has to be insulated. And additionally, these clips, and you can see the clips in the photo there, um, they're, holding the, they're holding the wall up. So I'm cut, again, we're back to that collapse. If one side's collapsed, it's intact. This framing is always done as per structure engineer. You want to fit a Form 15 for it. And more importantly, you want to sit down with your building certifier and say, are you okay? This is what I'm doing. This is out of the uh, CANAF uh, presentation. Um, some will accept that as DTS. Um, others actually want to see performance solution. Don't try and resolve that at three o'clock on a five o'clock CFC. You want to resolve that up front. And it's generally our advice, anytime you get fire, tell your building certifier what you're doing. If you're a builder, if you're a plasterer, tell them what he's doing, what you're doing. Uh, and you know, obviously we would suggest that a passive fire certifier needs to be involved as well. I want to tell this story. This is the coroner's court. This is a few years ago. This is what scares me. The, the challenge I have as a pacifier certifier is that I'm saying it's okay. I'm passing it on to for a builder who's also saying it's okay, and a building certifier at the other end is accepting it and saying, uh, you know, we believe that it's been done properly. And then the consumer comes in and lives here, and the, the, they, want to, they want life. They want to be safe to live here. That's what we do. We, we build compliant buildings so that people aren't going to risk their life. This is a story, what happened, old guy comes home, puts the stove on, falls asleep on the bed, stove starts a fire, the fire burns into his unit. And if you look at that photo in the background, typically, and if you've been around the industry for a long time, the fire out of wall goes to the ceiling, a non-fire out of the ceiling, fire spread. So what happened, the fire started in one unit, it spread up through the ceiling, down lights, whatnot, straight through 600 units, all of them burnt out, everyone else got out of the fire. The, the old guy died in the fire for a, a number of reasons, and there was a coroner's court because it was a death. Standing in the coroner's court was the pacifier certifier, myself, the building certifier who said it was okay, and the builder who built it. And this was the findings, and this is what I find rather scary. The coroner's finding was this. If you'd done it properly, he probably still would have died. Had he died in one of the other units, we'd be talking criminal and we're talking jail time. That should scare everyone. It scares me on a daily basis. Just want to talk a little bit about boundary walls. While a garage with a James Hardy or a passwood system or masonry is fairly straightforward, we've got a whole heap of challenges now around uh, the Fonzie flat. This is where we've got a two-story uh, where no longer are we a class one, we're a class two. We've got differences in boundaries. Instead of 900 away, it's 1.5 away. I just want to point out that area above units and which is the same area in that photo. They've done a great job in this case. I think it was uh, as Pronto board. They did a great job of fire rating up to the roof, but they didn't do above the, uh, above the roof, and that's the unit behind the back burning into the front. So I just want to be really conscious about um, what boundary walls we have. I also want to point out the, um, in this case, the traditional plasterboard. That external plasterboard has got to be multi-shield. The amount of standard plasterboard on external, um, long, think longevity. You can't. You want to. You want a moisture-resistant board there. All the systems have that. Um, the amount of times we see that as standard pink board instead of uh, you know green or blue board. The difference between the plasterboard and then sliding onto the James Hardy type things is the plasterboard is a, system, is a membrane system. It's the outside we can't get through. Whereas the James Hardy type problems is the whole system. There's a rock wall in the middle. That's what does the fire adding and the timber studs. I also see this is only timber studs because basically that out, outer uh, cladding, uh, and this is the James Hardy one. There's also uh, the CSR version of the same. The outside cladding falls off very quickly in a fire, six or eight minutes, and then the timber studs char up and the rock wall's got to stay there. That's why we want the rock wall nice and tight. That's why we don't want any penetrations in there. So when you're talking to James Hardy, the whole system is part of the uh, firewall and not just the membrane. So avoiding defects, get everything approved up front. D discuss it with your building sort of fire. Make sure they know what they're doing. Make sure the guys installing understand what they're doing. Um, question, 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 because at some point, if you're the builder, you're going to be liable. And certainly the builder certifier's point of view, he wants to make sure the Form 16 is by a reputable person and it, and it can rely on. Um, get the guides, make sure they're on site. If you're going to change your product, if it's CSR on the, on the drawings um, and it's going to be changed to borrow, just do so. And also check because the RWs and, and acoustics aren't always the same. Make sure the installers know what they're doing and have some hold points. Take some photos. Photos are free. Got a mobile phone, uh, take a digital photo. What I will say, we see a lot of photos sent to us and saying, are we on the right path? And some of them are, yep, pretty good, well done. 
a lot of them are, where is this job? Please don't do any more. Put the tools down. We're going to come over because it's really intervention stuff and start again. Um, I, I would suggest uh, somewhat commercial interest on that. Um, engage a pacifier certified and make sure you know what you're doing. So that's class one and boundary walls. Two to nine is a much bigger issue. And by a bigger issue, there's so many more moving parts. There's so many more products involved. You've not only got walls involved, you've quite often got penetrations involved, you've got doors involved, all of which have got to be uh, match, meshed together collaboratively. This is the list that uh, QBC sent us. These are the defects that they see out in the field. And this is the second page of it. It just goes on. We find the same issues. Uh, our standard, here's our top 10 defects uh, and how to fix them uh, is a training course we do all the time and really want to make sure everyone knows what they're doing. So on two to, two to nine, traditionally, you know, multi-res, that's mostly what we're doing. All the manufacturers have a whole heap of advice they can give, um, what systems going in it, how they inter interact. Um, and so you really want to get those. You also want to know all the different products. We're talking Hebel, we're talking speed panel, um, we're talking shaft liner, we're talking uh, inter walls with strata walls. They're all different and, and interestingly keeps us very busy. Every manufacturer has slightly different ways of doing it. Uh, and if, you, if you're touching, you know, if you're used to dealing with, with uh, CANAF, you're now going to use CSR, for example, there's a whole different uh, insulation processes you need to understand. This is what I want to scare you with. This is not special. This is out of my phone uh, a couple of months ago. Um, these are in Brisbane, um, and the one on the left is a hotel, and that's how it was left. The one on the right, interestingly, the one on the right, the question was asked of us, and if you have a look up inside the hole, uh, not a single penetration is treated. You've got roofing going over the top. Uh, because I've got a fire at access hatch, do I have to do this? It's not even a fire at access hatch, um, and that is the separation between a, layout, between a corridor and an SOU and a hotel. Um, this is what's supposed to save lives. I mentioned before, you know, 60% of all deaths are in the compartment outside of where the fire starts. Um, I don't want to work, I don't want to scare them with the Grenfell, but that was Grenfell's situation. When we're talking walls, everyone talks about the plasterboard and the screws and the cork. One of our major issues is the framing. So I'll give you some hints here. 64 mil stud, 0.55. It's a twin stud, which we see in multi-res. 2720 is the maximum height. But if you note, that's 0.25. Most uh, 1170 AS 1170 seismic and wind loads would have it at more at like more like 0.5 or 0.75. That was traditionally what we've done. I've seen those walls built at 4.2 meters. A lot of our failures are around framing. The framing will just not hold up. We have the same with shaft liner, where if the KPA wind pressure gets high, um, I go from four meters to two meters. It's it's a huge difference in frame. The frame's got to stand up. This is traditionally what we'd like to see. Um, you know, the, stu the studs are nice. I've got a de deflection head top track. I've got a nogging at the top. That nogging backs, backs the joint. I've got screws where they need to be. This is typically what we would inspect. The other issue I want to deal with um, is zinc anchors. So zinc anchors are the, the shore drives type products. Um, we're not allowed to use them in, in firewalls. They actually melt in a fire. It's a, it's a zinc alloy. It's got to be steel. And I think the, the, the table at the top sort of says non-compliant ones. I still see nylon anchors used in firewalls. I still see green spaghetti with screws. Uh, just make sure you're using a steel screw um, and uh, yeah, the hux tight screws down the bottom is what we do. This would generally be designed as part of our seismic and wind load from a, a Form 15 for walls. Uh, attached to walls are our doors and it's the, it's the next greatest thing. I think Grenfell was predominantly a door issue. That's what failed there. We, we got so much news about cladding, but uh, internally it was the compartmentalizations for the doors. This is the door frames ensuring they're filled. We want to make sure that um, the doors are right because it's, it's so hard to check it later. So when the walls are being checked from an inspection point of view, that's what we want to do. I want to, I want to talk about corners, keeping corners together because we, we don't want walls separating apart in a fire. They, they actually bow in different directions. That's why we want to tie them together. So the studs are going to be tied together. Corking is our one of our banes. The challenge is I actually want 10 mil gap. I want some corking in there because I've got to allow some deflection and some movement. Uh, that's why... It needs a you know 10 to 20 mils gap, and the top we're talking 20 mils, so it's you know 10, 15, 20 mils at the top. The other one, the photo down there with a couple of arrows pointed to it, the last screw is 100 mils. You can see there that 150 mils was screw. This particular job, we didn't like the little gap at the bottom, um, and we certainly didn't like the screw being too high, so it involved another screw. What you can't do though is you can't screw to the top track and you can't screw to the bottom track um, when you've got deflections. 
this is one of our greatest problems we see. The joints on either side of a wall can't be in line. They've got to be staggered by 300 mils or they've got to be back with the nogging. So quite often we'll see, um, I walk into a corridor um, and I can see where the joints are, it's very easy. I walk inside a door, look around the other side, it's the same height. Um, I know it's one of the great defects for um, one of the QBCC inspectors. He loves seeing that every time, or should say doesn't. Here's another example of a narrow strip. This is probably 217, uh, 213.50s for 27. The ceiling height was 27.50. So they decided to put a 50 mil strip in the middle. This was actually, the, uh, and for QBCC's benefit, this was not in Queensland. This was actually in New South Wales. But what they'd done, if you look on the right-hand side, they'd put a second layer of board over the top. And so it was still a 60-minute wall, um, and they only required one layer. The second layer was for acoustics. So we got this across the line because this was level 8 where we were engaged, and um, all the previous levels below, been, below had been done. So we called that first layer with the strip, the acoustics layer. The top layer was screwed off, um, and I won't even go into the fact that I got timber nogging because it's combustible in the wall. Butt joints is the biggest problem. I can't have butt joints on the same study either side of the wall, a major fail we see, particularly around doors. Uh, and the screw in the middle, these screws that are just sitting here, hold nothing. I've got to be 12 mil in, and I've got to be 200 mils apart and slightly staggered. Um, <laughs> the red line there is one, there was one screw missing on that. Other than that, that was an absolutely beautiful butt joint. That's how we want to see it. It's a, it's a rarity. Um, but butt joints are one of the things we need to look at. The other thing is breakaways. So this is probably a crane lift. Uh, they've, they've broken the sheet. If I put paper tape and plaster that in a fire, it'll last three minutes, and then I've got that hole in there. Every damage like that, cut out, framed, screwed. Um, each manufacturer has their, way, their own way of treating that on, on sizes, um, but don't allow defects happen like that. This this is where we've got uh, the joints not set, so it's an open joint. Therefore, I've got a smoke seal. If you're doing fire rating, do the fire rating, set it. You can see this one; they've come down a certain height to allow the ceilings to go in. Get it set, get it caught, get it finished, get it inspected and certified um, before you do the internal linings. The amount of these that uh, go up incorrect uh, worries me. The top one is how we not want to do it. The one down the bottom is, is how we like to see it. We've got a separation. We've, 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 we know how where they're going to go, where they're going to go in the system. Um, I've got um, all the systems that they're going to be using here. This is a penetration, obviously. But that was actually a training session. So each of those were done and uh, in, and as done as a training session. Um, and you know, if you're a building certifier, you want to be really happy that that's going on in the in the in the job. Um, this is a checklist. Um, you know, as you can see, this is sort of uh, section nine. But these are the things that we would be looking for on site and making sure all those things are right. Um, do we have the right stuff? Do we have the right screw centers? Are we got um, uh, 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 if I've got wet areas, am I screwing them for 200 or 100 mil centers, depending on the size of the tile? So let's go to the ceiling. Ceiling arrow is my greatest bane. Here's just two, what looked like pretty good ceilings. The one on the left, I can tell. There's five, there's five screws across it. They've screwed it at 300 mil centers. Every plasterboard ceiling is at 200 mil centers on each layer. The one on the right, clearly you see seven screws. I know that that's screwed off properly. That is how I want to see it. What I get all the time in defects is, you know, oh, when did this 200 mils come in? I think 1972, I think it probably came in. But either way, the system is 200 mils, but that's on each layer. So what I get a lot of is they tack the first layer up and screw the bottom layer. If you're thinking of fire in a two-layer system, the first layer gets all the intensity of heat, and the first layer actually falls away. At that point, you've got a high-intensity heat, and you want that second layer to do all the next 30 minutes. If it's got six screws in it, it's going to fall straight down. So from an inspection point of view, I want the first layer more important than the second layer. And little tip, if I want to get in the roof space to see what you've done, each screw is a different length and it's very easy. I actually want to see 14 screws across 1200. If I can't, I'm failing it. Pulling the first layer down, screw the first layer and put it back up again. It's not that hard. If you can't measure 200 mils in a tape measure, please don't install ceilings. This is how it's supposed to be. The edges have got to be done. The butt joints got to be offset. The joints have got to be upset. It's a quite a complex, and I haven't even started yet about the framing, the amount of framing. Generally speaking, if you're using a light gauge TCR with a uh, spanning 1200 with a furring channel, it generally is not going to hold two, two layers of 16 up. So the framing is just important, as I, I said before. Penetrations through those ceilings are also quite critical. There's ways we've got to treat them, but whatever you got, you've got to do, it's not just bash holes and do it. I've only got a very double layer system. It's generally an incipient spread. The incipient spread ceiling says the temperature of the back can't get above a certain temperature. And that's where we fail on a lot of these ones. If you've got penetrations going in, just deal with it up front. 
if you've got downlights going in, there's solutions for the downlights, um, but you need to know what you're doing. And some of these things can't be done retrospectively if, if they're hard up. I just want to talk about certification. So Form 16s, that's the world I live in. Um, we have a whole team doing them. This is a standard one, that's what it looks like. This is the information. I'll just go back one step. You can see the red box top. That's the description of what I've done. And then section six is the reference document. This is what it's supposed to see. This is what we're looking for in a Form 16. If you're not getting this level of detail, send it back. I'll also say this is certified by a pacifier, walls and ceiling certifier. So it says what systems I've used. Uh, I've, got, I've got a bit of speed in here, panel in here. I've got a maxillite in here. Um, and then there's the test reports down the bottom in section six. These are the test reports that say, I have inspected it to this level. You need to have all that information. The same goes for the penetrations and the like. So seismic and wind, this is a requirement of the BCA. And generally, it's a, it's a design and structure done by an engineer. You need a Form 15. So whenever you're building a building that's got certain sizes, certain heights, certain classes, uh, you need the Form 16. It looks a bit like this. It, talk, it de deals with internal wind loads. It deals with end, uh, earthquakes. Um, you just need that in place first. That's a very quick run through. If nothing else, I just want to make you, make you aware that there are a whole heap of issues that we need to deal with. If not sure, uh, there's a huge amount of advice. The manufacturers will help you. The ADWCI has a technical committee that can uh, point you in the right direction. Um, the ADWCI also do a training course. That's the, the, the one on the left there. This is a one-day training course just to get you a bit more information about plasterboard uh, and, um, and lightweight, lightweight wall systems. Um, the QR code, which you may be able to get, but if not, it's that web, uh, on the AWCI website. There's a whole heap of webinars, and the webinars are like 30-minute webinars. There's about 20 of them there at all different things. It could be a class one, it could be a class eight, uh, it could be uh, how to deal with penetration registers. So much to cover. Hopefully, I've pricked your attention to ensure that when fire's involved or pacifier's involved, give it its due attention. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter, for a real eye-opening presentation of real-life examples of what is happening in the industry today, which I'm sure will stimulate some additional thoughts when it comes to planning and the installation of firewalls and products. We would like to extend our thanks to Wayne Kennedy, Peter Blaine, Aidan Brisbane, and the Association of Walls and Ceilings for their participation in the QVCC Trade Tour and today's webinar. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to seeing you all at our next event. Good night, stay safe.